Good morning, everyone. We are very excited um, to be kicking off today. Uh, I am in Austin, Texas. We're going to be going shortly to our guests in uh, near Nanyuki, Kenya, near Mount Kenya. This is the kickoff, uh, the kickoff episode of the Nobility Project Summer Camp Safari. So every uh, Tuesday in June, we will be going to different conservation partners to see uh, important work with endangered species around the world. And today we are starting with uh, the last two northern white rhinos at Old Pejeta Conservancy in Kenya. And right now, I think we may be able to go live. Hopefully, Christy has them ready to go with Richard Vine, who's the managing director of Old Pej and a, a great conservationist. And look at that with Najin and but two, the last two Northern Whites. Good morning, Richard. Morning, Tech. How are you? Uh, how are you and Christy? Chris, Chris, we are doing, sorry, Christy. We're doing, we're doing good. Uh, Christy's uh, at the controls to make this happen. And, and we, um, you know, things have been uh, trying in the States the last few days, but truthfully for the last couple of months and in Kenya as well, I know that, um, that uh, the Corona uh, virus uh, issue there has shut down uh, tourism completely, and you have these amazing operations that depends on tourism. So we're really hoping to focus some attention on your work. Sure, Techno. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, it's much appreciated. We're uh, we're definitely shut down from a from a from an international tourism perspective. Hopefully that won't last too long, but unfortunately we fear the worst. So the predictions at the moment are that it won't recover until the middle of next year. So for us, that means we've got to find shed loads of money to keep our conservation work going uh, over that intervening period until such time as the uh, the international tourism trade returns. So fingers crossed it comes back uh, quicker than we think. So jumping to those beautiful uh, uh, creatures behind you there. So tell us about uh, the last two northern whites. And when we say last two, this is uh, the last great hope for this species. Sure. So I'll give you a little bit of history, Turk, which um, uh, uh, sort of potted history of the Northern White. But um, in 2005, 2006, there were about 30 left in the wild in a place called the Garamba National Park. And we tried to get we tried to get 10 of them to Old Pejita, knowing that those those animals were heavily threatened by poaching. And um, anyway, that 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 whole project got mired in politics and it never happened. But we built the infrastructure by that stage to house them. Uh, and so a, a zoo in the Czech Republic by the name of Dvor Kralove got a hold of us and said, we've had northern white rhinos in our zoo for the last uh, 20, 30 odd years. And we'd like to bring the last four potentially reproductive animals that we know of in, in captivity to Kenya in the hope that by putting them into a more natural environment, they would uh, that would stimulate uh, breeding behavior and we would be able to recover the species. Um, so they came here, the last four came here in 2009. It was two males, Sudan and Sunni, and also two females, Nain and Fatu. And in that period, by the time they'd arrived here, the, the last remaining wild population had been completely extirpated. They were, they were extinct in Garamba, so they truly were the last four when they arrived. Um, to cut a long story short, they, they um, having been bred, uh, except for Sudan, uh, in zoo conditions all of their lives, they took like a duck to water to the 600 acre enclosure that we built for them. They became semi-wild, they exhibited a lot of breeding behavior, uh, but they never got pregnant. The two females never got pregnant. Then Sunni died in 2014. Sudan died in 2018. So we're now left with the two females, which you see before you, Nain and Fatu. Both have reproductive issues um, and both, both are um, technically infertile in terms of their ability to get pregnant but their ovaries are still producing eggs. So the only hope now that remains for this species is for us to do uh, in vitro fertilization, which means removing eggs from those two females uh, using a meter long, slightly longer uh, than that. In fact, a meter long uh, probe, uh, which extracts eggs from the follicles in their ovaries. Those eggs then have to be exported within 24 hours to a laboratory in Italy, where a procedure called ICSI is performed, the intracytoplasmic uh, sperm injection procedure where an individual sperm is chosen to try to fertilize those eggs in the hope of creating an embryo. And so far we've extracted 20 eggs from both of these two females and we've managed to create three embryos which are now in storage in Italy in liquid nitrogen and we'll continue to repeat that process as often as we possibly can to get as many eggs as possible to create as many embryos as possible in the hope that one day we can develop a process 
and to reintroduce northern white rhino embryos into southern white rhino surrogate mothers um, to produce purebred northern white rhino calves. And we'd have to do that multiple times to eventually create a breeding herd of northern white rhinos that could form a platform for the reintroduction of that species in 20 or 30 years time into the Garamba National Park in the Congo. So that's the long-term uh, aim. It's obviously pretty tenuous. The chances of success are pretty small. It's going to be very expensive, uh, but this is what happens if you let a species diminish to the last two remaining animals uh, in the world. Film and photograph with you and see your work for you know more than a decade, and um, I've I don't know I, I've lost count of how many times I've been able to go in and be with with the girls as I call these two beautiful uh, northern whites and and also there is another another uh, rhino with them we've seen a third rhino and that is uh, a southern white and uh, so during the day. Um, these three rhinos we're looking at, they're, they're being very uh, cooperative with us right now. Zachary and uh, and Jojo, the, your rangers, are, have brought them in a little closer for us. They've got food, they've got hay. But during the day, they're, they're out in a much larger enclosure. And I've always noticed that Tawu, the southern white, is quite a bit wilder than the other two. So tell us a little bit of how that works. So, yeah, no, so, so, um, so Nain and Fatu were both, Nain uh, was, Nain is the, Gotta get this right. Nain is the uh, the daughter of Sudan, and Fatu is the daughter of uh, Nain. So the, uh, both both those females are zoo bred animals. They're accustomed to uh, being approached closely by humans. They've become, I guess, semi wild in the environment that we've provided for them. But Tao is a southern white female, so she's a different species. We have quite a big population of southern whites here, and we when we set up the the enclosures, what we did was try to make sure that they had the company of some southern whites to better kind of acquaint them with what it takes to be a wild rhino. And they befriended Tau, um, which rhinos often do. They're, they're, these are very closely related species anyway. And they formed this very close bond with her. Um, so she's, she's, she's a wild rhino, uh, but she knows if she hangs out with them, she gets food, the food, the same food that they get. Whereas if she was in the wild by herself, she wouldn't get that. So it's kind of in their interest, I think, although genuinely, I think they've kind of become friends. Um, but they're definitely, you know, they're definitely different species. And Tao is, is to all intents and purposes, a wild rhino. You can scratch Nain and Fatu behind their ears. If you try to do that with Tao, you might find yourself on the end of her horn. I've noticed that whenever I'm in with the rhinos, that it's a full-time job, usually for Zachary to... Uh get uh, between me and Tau uh, because she's always circling around as I'm filming, trying to get to me. Uh, later, we'll look at a funny photo of me trying to re retrieve my phone as one of the rhinos is coming on fast. Um, how do you tell the difference between a, a northern white and a southern white? Just to visually, how do you tell the difference? It's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult. Morphologically, they, they look pretty, pretty similar. Um, the, the, the northern white rhino is occasionally referred to as the Congo rhino or the fringe-eared rhino. And if you look at the, I don't know if they can show you on the film, but if you look at the northern white rhino ears, they have a hairy fringe, whereas the southern white rhino doesn't have that. But that's just a small, a small difference. They are, if you, if you get to know them well enough, you can tell the difference uh, in appearance, but it's, it's pretty minuscule. The differences manifest themselves much more in the way that they interact with their habitat, in the way that they socialize, and then what I think is more important is at a genetic level, there will be subtle differences between them that allow the northern white rhinos to exist in the habitat uh, where they evolved across kind of northern and central Africa. Um, and those genetic differences will be invisible to us, but will confer upon the northern white rhino the ability to, to exist in those areas, to be resistant to disease uh, that occurs in those areas, parasites that occur in those areas uh, to make uh, good use of the uh, vegetation and habitat that exists in those areas and etc etc the point being is if you took southern white rhinos and tried to introduce them into those parts of central africa from where the northern white rhinos come then they probably wouldn't survive because they don't have those subtle genetic traits and that's really the importance of this project they may look exactly the same and people have argued in the past that we don't really need northern white rhinos uh, because we have southern white rhinos 
But if we ever want to see northern white, uh, sorry, if we ever want to see rhinos again across Central Africa, which might sound like a pipe dream at the moment, but could conceivably happen in the next 50 to 100 years or even sooner, then we have to preserve a large part of the genotype which makes up the northern white rhino. And really, that's what all this project is all about. Uh, fantastic. I, I'm going to go back to an, an easy question. How much do these girls weigh? That's not an easy question, sir. I've got no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I should think about a ton and a half, something like that, maybe a little bit less. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it, it's a lot. And, and so I noticed that Tawu, we had a good shot a second ago of, of the southern white, and she has a much longer and sharper horn. Um, obviously, rhino poaching as with elephant poaching has been a huge issue over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, and we've had a, a massive decrease in the number of rhinos in the world. However, at, at Old Pechita, you've, um, you, you have a, a, you have a large force of rangers who not only guard these animals, but all the other animals in this, in this vast conservancy. Uh, approximately how many white and southern white and black rhinos do you have? So I think our population of, our population of southern whites is 36 odd, quite small. But we're, the, we're the home to the biggest population of black rhinos in eastern central Africa. So right now, top of my head, the population of blacks is about 134, I think it is. Um, and we keep a pretty close eye on each individual um, because that's uh, important in order for us to be able to ascertain that they still exist and to prevent animals being removed from the population without us noticing, uh, which is the way that poaching occasionally manifests itself. Just a quick point on the horns, to the, uh, the shape of the horn is actually not, not really a difference between the northern whites and, and the southern, southern course, whites. Yeah. The, reason, the reason the northern whites have a different shaped horn is because we've, we've cut them down and shaved them uh, over time. Uh, it doesn't hurt the rhinos at all, but it removes the temptation for people to try to kill them um, for their horn. Um, we haven't done it recently, but uh, that's, the, that's the explanation for the change or the difference in shape. Yeah, yeah, of course. And um, but your ranger program, uh, which is I mean, how many rangers do you have now? You go to that one. So uh, we our rangers are kind of categorized into very roughly two different kind of groups. We have what we call our rhino monitoring groups. So their their job is literally to find rhinos on a daily basis. And we aim to see um, across the whole the whole acreage. We aim to see each and every single rhino at least once every three or four days. And I think we have around about 120 of them maybe slightly less. And then the kind of teeth of our security operation are what we call the armed teams. So they uh, operate in groups of four. They deploy mainly at night. Um, they, are, they are highly trained and, and, and you know, um, Rhino coming to say hello to us, Turk. So we'll just, um, anyway, we'll deal with that as we carry on talking. <laughs> um, they get curious sometimes. So those armed teams, they're, they're helicopter deployable. They operate at night. They're properly equipped. They have their own dog section and they operate off the back of an intelligence network that we formed around us. And their job is to be the teeth of the, the, the uh, security operation. So it's, it's monitoring on the one hand and then it's uh, making sure that people are fearful of coming here on the second hand. And then if they do decide to come here, they're likely to be caught. That's the way it works. And, there, and because it works, your rhino population is increasing. You haven't had any poacher, any rhinos poached this year or last year, right? Yeah, I don't want to tempt fate. Sorry if we're moving around a bit, Tok, but we're trying to keep. No, it yeah, yeah, I think Tawu is. Uh, and Zach has got a tree strategically placed between him <laughs> and Tawu back there. It's quite, it's quite difficult to stop a hundred and, well, I mean, at one and a half tons of rhino. If they decide to go somewhere, they they go somewhere and. There's not a lot you can do to stop it. Um, no, we, we, I'm, I'm, I don't want to tempt fate by saying this, uh, Turk, but we, we haven't had a poaching incident on Old Pegeta for the last, well, since October 2017, which is a fantastic achievement. And actually, Kenya as a whole has done very well to stop rhino poaching, uh, unlike some other African countries where it's still a major scourge. I think Kenya last year lost somewhere in the region of three or four rhinos to poaching. Um, and, and probably more to sort of, um, you know, mortality, normal, more, normal mortality and uh, sort of accidental death. So, so Kenya's population of both southern white rhinos and black rhinos is growing. 
and growing reasonably quickly. The biggest constraint that we now face is much more around space because securing space for rhinos is expensive because of all the security that you have to provide for them. So, um, and if you don't provide space, then the population stops growing as quickly as it might. So that's actually the biggest constraint in Kenya at the moment. Whereas in, um, in other parts of the world, other parts of Africa, stopping poaching is, is really the, uh, the, 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 critical, the critical problem. So it's, it's horses for courses. We're doing all right at the moment, but you know, the, threat, the threat to rhinos is ever present. Uh, the demand for rhino horn in the Far East uh, remains. Um, and so we have to remain vig vigilant. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, it's, it's quite an impressive operation. I, I've been out there on the ground with uh, tracking crews. And um, I, I think the last time I was out, the rhinos spent more time, the black rhinos spent more time following us than, <laughs> than we did the other way around. It's important not to have your scent uh, be detected by those black rhinos. Um, I want to remind people that are watching, if you want to make a comment on Facebook and uh, ask, or ask a question, I also invite everyone, please share the feed, um, post it on your page so more people will find it. But if you want to ask a question, I think Christy, um, you know, that she just posted a comment from Eric Weber. And Eric Weber, we're going to get you on screen before long. Um, Eric says it's not as good as being there, but it's close enough. And right now we can't be there. Actually, next week, Eric and I and Christy and quite a few others from the No Valley Project had planned to be in Kenya. And of course, we had to go on our trip. But if people want to post some questions, uh, uh, most likely Richard, but possibly me, that I would answer them. Um, I saw if we get a chance, I know that, the, that both Jojo and Zachary are pretty, pretty busy back there. There's Jojo. But if we get a chance to say hi to either one of them, um, that'd be great. Um, is, is JJ wearing his? Uh, he was wearing his COVID mask, but he's uh, luckily, luckily, we haven't had too much COVID around here, so I think he's uh, he's I, pretty yeah, safe. I, so you can smile at you. Jojo has become quite famous uh, recently. I, I believe there's a, a, a baby rhino that's been named for Jojo. Is that correct? Yeah, North Carolina Zoo. North Carolina Zoo. That, that's fantastic. Um, how are, how long have you worked at? at Oh, Pajara. Now it's been almost nine years now. Fantastic. And so you, um, you know, a few years ago, we were the sponsors of Baby Ringo, Ringo the Rhino. We partnered with Ringo Starr on that project. And I know you were part of that team. And you worked closely with Sudan and now with both the two girls, correct? Yeah, at the moment, yeah. And he travels so, the world these days, Turk. He's become a rhino ambassador. So where have you been? You've been in America? I've been in America and also in UK yeah. for that, trying that, to create more awareness. That, that's fantastic. Um, you are also one of the, you're featured as our Zachary and, and James Mwenda, but in the film Kifaru, which we're hoping will, will screen widely in the US. Um, what did you, I, I saw the African premiere of Kifaru with you and the whole team in Nairobi. Uh, last fall, what did you think about the movie? Actually, the movie is nice because it's not all the people each one they can be able to come to visit to see what we are trying to see the species. But the movie is gonna be able to release all over the world, and people they can be able to see it, and also people they can be able to learn what is happening. Yeah, it's a very very moving film, but it, it also doesn't it doesn't just focus on Sudan, the last male northern white who who's lived quite a long life and is no longer with us. But it also follows the rangers. So, um, and I don't think people, a lot of people in the world, don't realize that being a ranger takes a lot of dedication and actually a, a very dangerous occupation as well. Um, but uh, you you work pretty long. You all of you work pretty long shifts. Is that correct? I mean, you're on duty with these rhinos for a long periods of time, correct? Yeah, and a lot of time we spend with them than the way we spend our with our family back at home. Is because we still want these rhinos to be live more, much more longer, and also we still want the next generation to be able to see them. That is the reason why we sacrifice day and night to try to protect these animals. I, when I visited with you and Zachary, um, I found that you know most people, if they have an animal they're caring for, what they want to do, I have a new, we have a new puppy at home. What we want to do is we want to 
get the animal to think like we do. <laughs> but I've noticed that in getting the behavior and you have these huge animals that are potentially very dangerous, it seems that you guys think more like the rhinos. Yeah. So these rhinos is like the same we have the dog at home, the cat at home. The same, same thing, they like to be scratched. Also, these rhinos, they like to be scratched, like behind their ears. But you get these rhinos, they are much more big. Sometimes you become to be afraid of them. But for us, because we have been here always all the time, so we are much more used to them. And also, they also trust us also. I'm sorry, repeat that last part. They also what? Because of that relationship, because of being uh, there close to trust, them, yeah. and also, they always also trust us to be able to go that close to them. Yeah. Because also they are part, like, uh, part of our families. That's fantastic. And do you and for you or Richard, either one, the, the normal day of the of these three rhinos is not around a bale of hay. Um, so what's the what is the routine for the day? At night, I know they're locked in in a pretty tight, uh, uh, tightly guarded uh, area. But in the day, they have a lot of room to roam. Is that right? Yeah. So each and every other morning. Just hang on, Ted. We might have to. Uh, All right. To view us. Come and say hi. Okay. Apparently, come and say hi, Tech. Oh, that's fantastic. Although JJ's run away, so I don't know what we're supposed to do. <laughs> oh, well, that is, uh, that's okay. You stay safe, and what a beautiful shot. Both of those shots are just absolutely exciting. Um, we have a question while they're walking up, Richard. Someone just, um, Ashley has just asked, what do people do with the horns when there's poaching? Uh, the horns are just made of keratin, the same as our fingernails. So there's there's no really no scientific or medicinal use, right? Yeah, no, exactly that. Uh, same as our fingernails, keratin. It's a, uh, a really, there's a long history of rhino horn use. It used to it started in the Middle East. In fact, they used to use them as handles for jambiers, for daggers, and then um, that was in the oil. The time when they were discovering oil in the Middle East, Middle East, and there was lots of new wealth. Um, then thereafter, there's always been a sort of medicinal uh, market for horn in the Far East, uh, particularly in China. And that continues to this day. And it's the same thing as that part of the world has become more affluent. The money that people are prepared to pay has increased dramatically. Uh, and obviously, it's a commodity which is in short supply. So the price is very high. And therein lies the issue. As soon as you have a high price for a commodity, um, people are incentivized to kill that animal to get it. So it doesn't have any, it's got to a stage now in places like Vietnam where the, uh, the, uh, a little bit of powdered horn in a drink at the end of the evening is kind of produced to seal a business deal as a hangover cure. Um, and it's like having a Porsche or whatever parked outside your house. It's a kind of status symbol. If you've got rhino horn to give to your guests at the end of the evening, then you are, you're one of the men around town. And, and that's really what it's morphed into. So it's kind of lost its medicinal um, purposes and become, become a little bit like a Gucci handbag, which is sad for rhinos. Yeah, it's like, like having a horse that, you, that doesn't actually go anywhere. Doesn't do anything. Um, I saw Tawu knocking over the bale of hay for something greener back there in the back. That, it's pretty funny. Uh, the incredible shots of the rhino this morning. Um, they, they, they tend, they're normally a bit better behaved, Tuck. I don't know what's happened this evening. It must be the sound of your voice. Uh, it may be. I'm, I'm sure they miss me as much as I miss them. Speaking of missing them, one of the things, this might be a good time to talk about the conservancy as a, as a whole. And I also want to get to the to your volunteer opportunities. When things open back up, I, I, people should know that it's there's a lot of ways to visit uh, your great conservancy. But So you don't just have rhinos. We, we know you have 130-something uh, southern uh, uh, black rhinos and... Um, when you travel there, you see the whites because there's there are out in the open grazing in the fields. Actually, why don't you tell everyone about the difference between a white rhino and a black rhino visually with the mouth and sure. So so they're very different species. They um, the the black rhino is a lot smaller, uh, much more singular, uh, much more aggressive. Uh, likes to likes to hide away in thick bush. And it's primarily a browser, so it has what they call a prehensile lip, which is a kind of pointed upper lip. 
Um, and that, that enables it to kind of grip branches and twigs and snap them off with its teeth. So to, to select what it's wanting to eat with the prehensile lip and then to, 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 to bite them off with its teeth. So it's a selection device. Uh, whereas the white rhino is a grazer. And the reason it's called the white rhino is because it has a wide mouth uh, adapted for grazing grass, just like a lawnmower, really. Um, and the South African word uh, for, for wide is white, um, which is the reason it got its name white rhino. There's actually no real difference in color between white and black rhinos. It's just that the white rhino had been called the white rhino because of its mouth. So when they wanted to describe the black rhino, they called it the black rhino because it was different. So uh, that, that's really the origin of it all. There's no, as I say, there's no difference in color. Thanks, that, that, the good, good explanation. Um, so you've got rhinos, but uh, there's a lot of other amazing species at the Conservancy. You, you have a large number of elephants. I mean, if you start thinking about the signature species, you have a lot of elephants and a lot of lions. Um, sure. You know, we're, we're, we're part of the bigger, what we call the Lycipia. We sit on a plateau at the base of Mount Kenya, which is called the Lycipia Plateau. And it's one of the last great sort of wilderness areas of Kenya, in fact. And it's home to the second largest population of elephants in Kenya, numbering around about, I think it's between seven and 8,000 heads. So there's about 35, 36, 37,000 elephants in Kenya, and 8,000 of them live on this plateau. So we'll always have elephants here. They come and go. Um, we have corridors in our fence lines. We have fence lines to keep the rhinos in because they're so heavily threatened by poaching that we have to keep them within an area where we can closely monitor them. But we have corridors in those fence lines which prevent the rhinos going out, but allow everything else to go in and out. Um, and, and the elephants do exactly that. And some of our elephants we know migrate you know, upwards of 200, 300 kilometers away from us for parts of the year and then come all the way back again. And that's, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the important thing to understand about you know, big, uh, sort of mega herb herbivores like elephants. They need space to migrate in response to seasonal rainfall patterns and for other other ancient reasons that we probably don't understand. And similarly, that would apply to other species. So giraffes to some extent, zebras, buffaloes, those kinds of species. Um, and we also have high populations of predators. So we have some of the highest densities of lions uh, in Kenya. Lions, people don't realize, are pretty endangered across Africa. They reckon there may only be 12,000 lions, 12,000 lions left in the whole of Africa, of which may be 1,500, but probably less are in Kenya. So lions as a species are actually under real threat. Um, and we have good populations of lions, but they also need to roam over big areas. They need big territories. They need to be able to expand you know, outside of the environs of old vegeta when, uh, when, when, when the place gets full. And that's the importance of our corridors, but it's also important that when they move through our corridors, they're going into areas which are also friendly from a conservation perspective. So lions um, are, are a big sort of key species here, but also cheetahs, uh, quite a few cheetahs, lots of leopards, lots of hyenas, uh, both striped and spotted, lots of other smaller sort of predator types, and then all the prey species that you would typically expect to find in a, an East African kind of savanna system. Uh, great. Uh, thanks. I've got a couple of questions and I'm going to come back to the conservancy. W one of them, uh, well, the one that's up right now says, do rhinos ever get mad at each other? If they're, they're, the, the rhinos uh, have conflict with the way maybe uh, male lions do? Yeah, no, all the time. <laughs> they, they fight like cat and dog. We, uh, we, uh, we lost a male the other day from fighting a black rhino. Um, little calves often get in the way uh, black 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 rhino males are quite sort of uh, robust shall i say when they want to mate females so there's a whole uh, there's a whole process that goes on that occasionally injures the females and often the calves get in the way so they you know they have their own way of kind of dealing with life uh, which is a little bit different from us i guess um but it's all part of the way they've evolved um and they most definitely fight as do you know all other species uh, often between males and that, that's just a way of, you know, if I'm the big tough guy, that means my genes are going to be fit, fit for purpose. And you as the female would do well, well to mate with me. That's really what it's all about. Great. Uh, we also had a question about the rhino's connection to, the, you know, in the wider ecosystem as well. How does it impact ecosystems if we lose 
rhinos. I think the same thing would apply for Scotland for lions. But, um, you know, obviously everything's connected. So everything's connected 100. percent You know, there's two ways of looking at it. One is that rhinos are what they call an umbrella species. So you devote a lot of time and effort to looking after rhinos because they're heavily or critically endangered. And in so doing, you provide habitat that can be used for other species. But also there's lots of evidence to suggest that they are big modifiers of rangeland areas. They have a huge impact on the species of grass that grow and how that grass grows. Um, and in turn, that will have impacts on, <clears throat> you know, the... Uh, the, for, the, the, the flora and fauna, so all the way down to small insects. Um, so it's, it's, it's all interconnected. Everything is interconnected. And you, you remove one um, strand of the web and the other, uh, if you're not careful, the other parts of the web can come tumbling down. And that's, I think, something that we humans need to learn about a little bit. Yeah, we're in a situation where um, the losing species i mean we have these signature species all month long we're doing these camps first we have uh first we have the, the rhinos and next week we'll be at uh angama Maro, uh talking to adam banister about lions and our elephant project um speaking uh with their work to, to eliminate or to minimize elephant to human wildlife conflict which is you know an issue with all kind of wildlife conservation and um then we move to the Mount Gorilla, Dr. Gladys in Uganda, and, and finally we'll be in Mexico with our friends uh, who work with uh, the monarch butterfly migration. And in all of these cases, the the you know the larger ecosystem is really the bigger question. There's a, a carrying capacity of the land, and there's also um, the fact that we have human needs. And I think for a long time the idea was we'll make these enclosures, we'll just kick the people out, we'll guard these animals in one space. But um, it, there has to be some, you know, be, some benefit for local communities to understand and be a part of this conservation. I think that's something you guys have done really well. Sure. You know, um, that, that that is modern conservation thinking, uh, Turk. You, you, in many respects, have to look after the needs of people before you can look after the needs of wildlife. You know, rhinos, if they're given secure habitat, will look after themselves, as will most other species. Um, and the bigger the habitat, the easier that becomes. Um, but human populations, particularly in places like Africa, are growing really quickly. And you can't ignore the needs of humans um, at the expense of creating space for wildlife. So the accommodation that is gradually being evolved and developed is sort of along the lines of um, how, how do you create conservation space? How do you create and maintain conservation space uh, at the same time as looking after the social and economic needs of humans? And I think that's what Old Pegeter is all about. We don't, we don't view our land as the kind of preserve of wildlife. We, pres we, we look at it as a, as, a, as a piece of land which we need to operate as productively as possible uh, to produce as much as we possibly can uh, for reinvestment, if it's money, back into the land and into more conservation and also into social and economic development. And if that land in the process employs a lot of people in a country where formal employment is hard to come by, that's also a good thing. And if we pay tax uh, and contribute to the national exchequer because we're productive, we believe that's a good thing. And if we can, and we've created a model which basically does that, we call it the integrated approach to wildlife conservation, um, where nothing is sacrosanct, where uh, any activity is considered if we can do it at the same time as maintaining conservation space. So, for example, we keep 7,000 head of cattle on Old Pegeta. Uh, that's a kind of reflection of our ranching history. Um, but that, that, those cattle are in the same space at the same time as all of our wildlife, including our rhinos, including our lands. Um, they make profit for us, they employ people, and all of the profit and surplus they make gets reinvested back into maintaining that piece of land. And also, as I said um, earlier, you know, developing more land for conservation and also supporting social and economic development. So it's a very holistic approach, which excludes nothing, but maintains as, it, as its key objective and the need to provide the habitat uh, that is suitable to maintain biodiversity, otherwise known as conservation. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. It, it, um, and it's amazing when you're you know at the conservancy and especially out on the western side, you'll see these large herds of beautiful cattle. And but you know, walking by on the fringes, there may be 
zebras and large group of giraffe and and um it, and when you say integrated it, it it actually is and of course the money that comes in from those cattle uh is money that goes to support the conservation work so uh, it's amazing we've also partnered i mentioned earlier um with jojo about the ringo the rhino project but uh, you have um Opet has partnerships with a lot of local communities. I've lost track of how many, including the schools and health work and water systems. Um, the Nivelli Project partnered with you guys. I think Christy has a picture she's putting up. You probably can't see it right now, but it's a picture of a bunch of big smiling kids, uh, smiling primary school kids at Arari Primary, which is a water system that we built um, with you on the northern side of the Conservancy. and. Uh, really fantastic uh, rainwater collection system with a vast uh, storage uh, and distribution system there. And that one was really great. Um, I wanna th we want to thank our partners at um, at Triana Wines and Austin Hope Winery, um, and also at Well Aware, a Well Aware World based in Austin, Texas. Christy's put up a photo now. This is another water system we built in partnership with you at, in Tweeney, where you had a well that needed a completion, basically. And I think everybody knows at this point that kids need water. And, um, so here's the, the, the photo of, is a really lovely photo of uh, uh, Mike. I think Mike is watching. Hi, Mike, if you're out there. Mike Mutuku um, with Well Aware and I and a bunch of kids from the school. And um, it, it, it's a big change. We're working with actually just building a library at a high school in uh, Nanyuki at Low East Girls uh, with, um, with you guys. And when uh, schools are all closed down right now, but when schools reopen, these water systems and that library and the other work that uh, goes on in the schools carries on. And I think that's an important part of the relationship with the community. So congrats to you guys and thanks for being a great partner. And we, and we love, we love uh, partnering with you guys, Tech. It's been, I don't know how, we, how long we've known each other, but it's quite a few years now, I think, isn't it? Um, and well aware and everybody else who uh, who helps us from the US and and it goes back to exactly what I was saying and which I know you understand completely that need to to demonstrate the conservation doesn't always just come at some huge cost uh, to people's livelihoods or to some government that has has to subsidize it in fact it can be if, if, if properly constructed it can be an engine for economic development um, which is, which is good for people and it's good for wildlife um, and there are, there are models now which are evolving to demonstrate that. Uh, a lot in Kenya, in fact. I think Kenya is almost probably the leader in its field, but also other parts of Africa and other parts of the world. So, uh, no, we really value our relationship with the Nobility Project. Uh, it's been a fantastic relationship for many years, Turk, and long may it continue. Um, uh, great. And we had a question from Emma, um, Christy had up just a moment ago on the screen, about what, what aspects of... Uh, working with the lo local community seem to be most useful and are, are they open to the work that you guys do? Yep, I'm not sure if Richard heard me on that one. The question was, um, in, in the healthcare, water, schools, uh, the, the community. Uh, yeah, no, tell, yeah, I think we... Uh, we've got a little delay here. I tell you what, Christy, let's go, um, uh, and I'll, I'll answer Emma's question from my end, which is, you know, I've been at a lot of these communities. Obviously, the Nobelli Project works up all over Kenya with rural communities, and uh, it, the work we do has just been, you know, so welcomed and I think so helpful, especially building the infrastructure that will last for generations there. So, uh, Richard, if you can still hear me, uh, I, we might have had an audio problem for a second. When people, there's, you have dog, a dog team with your rangers. That's one of the one of the groups that people can visit. Um, I think because he's got a couple of photos uh, when I've been out with the dog teams. This is one of the rangers with, I think that's uh, Scruffy and uh, Scarf, uh, the puppy when he was making training. And uh, this is an American blood, a southern bloodhound that can... Uh, that can go forever tracking down if a poacher or someone with a snare or something gets in the conservancy. Um, you, you have a more than one just tracker dog, so correct? Sure, it's an integral part of the um, the kind of security operation. They, uh, you know, a lot of security works on the basis of deterrent. Um, 
And those tracker dogs, they, uh, they, their job is to track up on, on if we get incursions into the conservancy, people looking for rhinos or whatever, which does happen on a fairly regular basis. But actually, a large, a large part of their work is working in the local communities at the behest of the Kenya police, um, chasing up on issues of petty theft, and they've caught rapists before and murderers and all sorts of different uh, nasty people. So that 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 helps us with our relationship with the local community. So we become valued not only as a as a uh, contributor to kind of social and economic good, but we also become um, a, a, a force for stability, if I can put it that way, and security. Um, and it's, it goes back to that holistic um, approach that I was talking about. You can't, you can't, you can't do conservation in isolation. Conservation is a increasingly a, across the world. It's a it's a social and economic issue, and you can't ignore those two issues. And if you do, you do so at your own peril because you can't be successful at conserving wildlife without without considering that, without considering the needs of people. It's really very often about people. Uh, it is indeed, you know, climate change in general, the growing population in the world. There's a lot of a lot of pressure on the natural world, obviously. And um, in the long term, we have these signature species like rhinos and and like monarch butterflies in the U.S., which cover a vast range. But you have these signature species, and in many ways, when you're protecting the larger areas for the species, you're protecting an entire ecosystem. Um, you know, we stand to lose. Extinction is, is a massive threat in the world, and um, the kind of work you guys are doing, I think, is, is going to be key everywhere. Um, will. Could you tell us a little bit about visiting? I want to, also, we want to go look at this at a new baby rhino video in a second. But if people want to visit, uh, when things that tourism open up, schools are closed down in Kenya right now, and actually so are arrivals. But when things open up again after after these tough times with the coronavirus, um, there's a way to visit your conservancy. You've got high end, beautiful tented lodges, and and you've got. Uh, I think some of the more comfortable, actually affordable places as well, and the volunteer opportunities. So. Uh, how does all that so, so we we um just to give everybody an idea of the kind of economics we depend for our existence and our work uh our, for, or, for, or on, on, on revenue that we earn from tourism and, and and cattle ranching and agriculture and various other things that we do of that revenue 55 percent approximately is from tourism so it's fundamentally important to us and tourism is a fickle business, so it's good to be in different segments of the tourism marketplace. So we need to be at the top end, and we need to be at the bottom end, budget traveler, and we need to be somewhere in the middle. And then we need to have a whole range of different products that we can offer people. So if you come here, you can do volunteer experiences, and I think there's 22 different experiences. So you can come and visit the Northern White Rhinos as an example, or you can go land tracking, or you can go for a night game drive, or you can go out on patrol, or you can go out with the tracker dogs. There's lots of things you can do. Um, and the whole idea behind that is to give people an experience which is immersive, so they understand what conservation is all about. So they stay here for a little bit longer because they're enjoying themselves so much. And uh, whilst they're here, we can make a bit of money out of them so that we can do more conservation and, and sort of community development work. So that's that's how we position ourselves. We've got a website, it's very easy to navigate around. Um, www.oldpegetaconservancy.org so it's pretty straightforward to find or just type in old pegeta and you'll find us and we are most definitely looking forward to the resumption of international travel because right now without it we're missing 55 percent of the revenues that we need to keep going um, so the sooner that can happen the better and anybody who's listening who wants to come you're more than welcome we have a fully fledged tourism department we have people who can answer all of your queries and we can help you put it all together so give us a call. Fantastic. Uh, the speaking of revenues and lost revenues, um, we're gonna we've got a brand new piece of video uh, for, for something, something part of. You can make that full screen, Christy. So you have new baby rhinos and young rhinos that are um, have been born on the conservancy, and then they many of them need sponsorship. Um, and they need you know, with that sponsorship comes the ability to name the rhino so we're looking i don't think you can see it but you you know this shot uh, we're looking at a, a, a black rhino female a mother and her young calf and this uh 
Maybe is being sponsored by the New Valley Project. We're happy to announce today, and that we're, we're naming this young black rhino in honor of Leon Buck Weber, who is the father of our board chair, Eric Weber. And Buck Weber was a pilot, an amazing pilot. He was a veteran of World War II and the Korean and the Vietnam Wars. He took off recently. He took off on his final flight on May 1st. 83 years old, he lived an incredible life, and we felt a young black rhino in the wild would be a great match. So everybody here is thinking about it. And um, tell us a little bit about uh, the, the other, this maybe this rhino or about other rhinos there, the baby rhinos that need to be sponsored. Thanks, Dick. So, so Buck is, Buck I believe is, is the, I think Buck is about 10, year, 10 months old. And I think he was, sorry, I'm trying to keep an eye on Fatu. Um, he was, he's the, uh, he's the latest calf from a, from a female rhino called, I think it's Kathy. So we, we, um, we name all of our rhinos. Each and every single rhino has a name. The reason we do that is because we, as I mentioned earlier, record the um, location of each and every single rhino at least once every three days. And using a name is the simplest way of doing it. And it's slightly more, slightly more fun than calling it a number or something. Um, so um, we offer people the opportunity to name a rhino. And um, you guys have named Buck, Buck, for the reasons you explained. And for that, we're incredibly grateful. And that rhino will be known for the rest of its, um, for the rest of its days as Buck. And what I mean by that is in, when the patrols are, are, are looking for rhinos, they'll find Buck and it'll be reported into the control center as we found Buck and Buck is in this particular location and Buck is looking good and his condition score is four out of five or whatever it happens to be. Or Buck appears to have had a fight or Buck appears to be mating with so-and-so when he gets a bit older. So the whole history of Buck will be known. Um, and it's something that uh, people, people love the idea of having a rhino named after them. I think we, uh, I think we still have 20 rhinos to be named. Um, so anybody who'd like to do that, um, contact us um, and we'd be more than willing to help. It's, uh, it's a nice way of, uh, it's a nice way of uh, remembering people um, and just knowing that their names and their memory will be continued uh, for as long as that rhino is alive. Beautiful. You know, I think if anybody wants to make that connection through us, they can contact uh, Christy and me and Liz at info at nobility.org too. Um, I think Eric Weber, whose father was Buck, may be able to join us. Do we have Eric? There's Eric Weber, who's been to oh, Petra that many times. Hi, Eric. What do you think? Hey, Turk. Uh, how are you? And uh, Richard, I'm, I'm having my tea with milk today. Uh, I don't normally do that unless I'm in Kenya. Uh, where I would have been in a couple of weeks. I'm so disappointed not to be able to be there uh, this year, but we'll do it again. And I'm so uh, honored on behalf of the family to be watching Buck there. Um, certainly it's been a lot of years since anybody said Buck appears to have been mating, but uh, uh, he would have <laughs> uh, He would have loved that very much. Uh, and so he lived vicariously through my many trips to, to Africa and to, to old Pegida. And so uh, quite an honor for the family. And, and he would get such a big kick out of that. Uh, and so uh, thanks to, to you for everything you do there, Richard. And thanks to you and the Nobility Board. It's, uh, it's just uh, I was so touched. And everybody in the family was. Thanks for that. Thank you, Eric. Be sure to get the rest of your family to watch that video. This video, by the way, will stay up in our, our, our stream. It'll stay on Facebook Live, and anybody can share that, and people will be able to pick up the, uh, the whole thing um, whenever they're ready. Um, talking about the different places to go, Eric and I are both big fans of, I mean, you have these beautiful safari tented camps, and, but we love the Pelican House, which is an old ranch house with a fast fireplace. It's a really great place to stay. And, um, um, it's, uh, I wish I was there right now, actually. It would be a really fantastic time to be with you. Um, before we go, I want to talk about one more thing, which is uh, anybody who has kids, we, we'd like to get them to go to your website and consider entering the Art of Survival competition. And this is this great art competition. We see the logo up with us now. Um, ages 5 to 18, there's two categories of uh for the younger entries and the older entries, and it's not just painting. Um, Richard, what, 
what can be better? Uh, if you can write, or like you can draw, or what can be in the art of survival? Sure, Jack. It's centered around the um, centered around the theme of extinction. Um, obviously, that's something we're into. Well, we, we'd like to raise awareness about. I, I think it costs ten dollars to enter, and you can do anything. You can you can paint a picture, but if you're not a very good painter like me, you can write a poem. If you're not a very good poet like me, you can write an essay. If you're not a very good writer like me, you think um, you think innovatively and do something that you think um, helps uh, helps sort of uh, you know inv uh, helps uh, delves into the, the 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 issue of extinction and its implications for humankind. Um, so anything you can think of, we're open to it. Um, and if you win, you get a fantastic prize, which is a an all expenses paid trip to Kenya for I think a week for you and your family. So it's definitely worth entering for ten dollars. Uh, you could be coming to Kenya as soon as COVID-19 allows you to come. It's really an incredible opportunity. And, uh, you know, if a lot of people enter, those $10 add up. And um, it just goes to show, you know, this competition is literally the, an art of survival for you guys as well. And um, the, the ways that you reach out and engage with people, I think, are, are really, really key. Um, the... Um, I, you know, we, we can't talk about it all, but I just want to, before we go, I, I want to tell people I never mentioned that Jane Goodall established a chimp sanctuary, chimpanzee sanctuary there that, that you guys maintain and that rescue and house for their lives, chimpanzees who've come out of captivity and, and other dire circumstances. Um, there's lion tracking, the elephants, the whole place is just amazing. But the heart of it are these two girls. Um, Najin and, and Fatou, who seem to be headed back for the evening. It looks like they're about ready to say goodnight to us. <laughs> As I say, when they decide to go, there's not a lot of stopping them. So, yeah, they've gone, I'm afraid. Uh, you won't be seeing them. They won't, they won't be coming back until tomorrow morning. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, this whole thing has been fantastic. We are gonna sh we're gonna show you have an emergency appeal video. It's quite it's quite short and quite beautiful. Christine is gonna put that up full screen and then we'll say goodbye. Let's watch this. Yeah, that, 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 I love that video. It's short and to the point and sweet and really beautiful images. Uh, at the beginning there, people can see uh, beautiful Mount Kenya back there behind you. Um, anyway, I, I just want to tell and say thank you to you and Zachary, to Ellie, who's operating camera. Everyone should know also that uh, this is just for you guys. This is one of the show that you do every day. If, if you can go to... Uh, on Facebook or Instagram and find Old Pejita, you, you can see their sofa safaris. This is one of the sofa safaris. I should have welcomed everyone for the sofa safari. But uh, every day, every day, five days a week, I think there's a, there's a new uh, a program about new aspects of the work you do. I, mean, I really hope people will check that out. It's it's the way I start my day. If you have an afternoon one there, I start with it here in the morning. Um, Next week, uh, we are going to be back uh, looking at lion cubs and male lions and talking about lion conservation more as we talk touchstone here. Uh, we'll be in the Maasai Mara at uh, beautiful Angama Mara with uh, Adam Bannister, an incredible wildlife photographer. Um, but for now, I just want to say thank you, Richard. Uh, any closing words? Any closing words there for us, Richard? Uh <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. Uh, sure, I'm laughing, Ted, because the uh, I told you the rhinos had gone home, and they all came back. 
They miss now, me. Uh, they're, they're getting a bit feisty. So we're... No, they miss you. Exactly. They miss you. So we're... Um, no, no closing words. Thank you. Uh, all, all I would say is thank you, Turk and Christy, for all of your support over the years. It's invaluable and it's very valued and appreciated. Um, we look forward to having you here again soon. Uh, it's been too long. Um, and I know you've got a group to bring out, which we've had to delay. So um, stay well. And we really look forward to, 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 to having you. And thanks for coming to visit us, this, visit us this afternoon, albeit only virtually. Thank you, Richard. And last note, if you any young viewers out there or any parents who have kids, encourage your kids to learn about conservation. Um, it is really going to be one of the great, most important causes of our time. And, um, you know, these days going to work at an office for all kinds of reasons doesn't doesn't necessarily sound as appealing as it used to. Let's go take that major career path. And there are amazing conservationists all over the world, uh, young people who, when they, at some point, they saw a picture of a rhino and said, oh, that's what I want to do. And they're not just in Africa, in the United States, and every corner of the world. So conservation is going to be key. Thanks to everybody for watching. Please share. And um, I guess Christy is going to show our preview so we can see what the next episodes are going to be. Bye. Zebra. She's so beautiful. You can see where she was attacked. But she's going to be raised and released back into the wild. Hi, everyone. Turk Pipkin for the Nobility Project. And we are excited to announce our new summer camp safaris. Every Tuesday morning in June, we'll be going live on Facebook Live with some of our key conservation partners in East Africa and Mexico. We'll be up close and personal with some incredible animals and with the people who care for them. We'll be learning about the work to save these species. It's live, it's free, and it's fun. It's all on Facebook Live. We'll see you Tuesday mornings. Here's a sneak preview. Okay. So this is Najin and Fatou, the last two female northern white rhinos in the world now that we've lost Sudan.